ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we praise him for all that he has blessed us with and as we come here today to resume our class after an interlude of around six weeks or seven weeks uh, because of the blessed month of Ramadan, all of us, subhanAllah, we feel a sense of uh, post-Ramadan, if you like, depression. All of us, we feel a sense of emptiness, especially when Ramadan finished. It was just a, a shocking, if you like, experience that here we are surrounded by Iman, surrounded by brotherhood, surrounded by Quran, and then instantaneously, overnight, uh, even though it was the day of Eid, even on the day of Eid, we felt a spiritual emptiness. And this is lasting and persisting. Uh, and this is in fact the reality of Ramadan. And inshallah, it's also a positive sign because it shows that we appreciated the blessings of Ramadan. And we were enjoying the spiritual environment of Ramadan. And in that absence, we feel a loneliness. We feel an emptiness. And the positive is that it shows that we appreciated the blessings of Allah in Ramadan. Now the question arises, how then do we increase that uh, spirituality? How do we re-enter that uh, beautiful spirit of Ramadan? And the response is, uh, of course, you can never recreate that feeling of Ramadan until the next Ramadan. That's what makes Ramadan special. But what we can do, a number of things that we can do, first and foremost, one of the biggest differences in Ramadan and after Ramadan is masjid attendance. Masjid attendance. In the days of Ramadan, mashallah, the masjid is absolutely full. And we need to have a tent outside to house all of the people. And then the day after Ramadan, that attendance is one-fifth or one-tenth, or we seek Allah's refuge, even less than that. And this really shows that Ramadan is a month of the masjid. It's the masjid, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is filled up. And therefore, one of the things that we need to do is to increase our association with the masjid. Another way to recreate that feeling of Ramadan uh, is that, of course, the Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. And we were reciting the Qur'an and listening to the Qur'an and surrounded by the Qur'an. And therefore, once we are used to this, after Ramadan, we need to have a healthy relationship with the Qur'an. By reciting it, by increasing our prayers in it, by listening to it. And as I advised you many times, especially in the month of Ramadan, that we should cut back on listening to that which is of no value when we go to work, when we're uh, uh, you know, going from point A to point point B and instead listen to beneficial stuff and especially the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another uh, difference between Ramadan and post Ramadan is the increase of nafil worship. In Ramadan, we're doing lots of things. We're fasting, we're praying extra, we're giving charity. When Ramadan finishes, a lot of us resume our schedules that we had before Ramadan, and this is a mistake. We should all have an increasement in some type, whether it is in the quantity or the quality or both of our deeds, we need to increase that. And of course, of the ways to uh, get back some of that spirituality and to feel uh, what we want to feel is of course to immerse ourselves in knowledge and to study the book of Allah and to study the sunnah of the messenger of Allah and to study the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam because nothing increases one's iman like knowledge. Nothing increases one's iman like knowledge and therefore inshallah uh, one of the ways to get back that feeling is to resume our halaqat which we were doing and that is exactly what inshallah ta'ala we are doing now. Now in our previous uh, lectures we had discussed the early prophet or the early seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his childhood and we had gotten to the place where he became orphaned once again for the third time with his grandfather Abdul Muttalib and we explained some of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested this young child with so many different tests and that was as we said to make him stronger, to make him independent, uh, to make him uh, someone who has a sense of compassion at the same time uh, so that Allah could say that we took care of you. Uh, Nobody has any favor over you. Allah directly took charge charge of taking care of you. And there are many other uh, benefits and blessings, uh, hidden blessings in that. The next stage of the Prophet's life involves a story that all of us are familiar with and that is his travel to Syria as a young child. Now this story is a story that we all know 
And to summarize, the Prophet ﷺ undertook a journey to Syria. When he was around 9, 10, 11 years old, uh, his uncle Abu Talib would go with the caravan. And it is said that the year that he was going, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Who are you leaving me with? How can you leave me all alone here? He's a young child. And so Abu Talib uh, cried out of compassion and he decided to take the young boy along even though that was not the initial plan. And uh, they went to uh, the land of Syria, the Rihlat al shita it was Saif, as we mentioned over and over again, they had a summer journey and they had a winter journey. They're going up north to Syria and then they're going down south to Yemen. And so the Prophet ﷺ traveled uh, with Abu Talib as a young child and they would pass by the monastery of a monk by the name of Buhayra. Buhayra. Uh, monks or hermits were those people in medieval Christianity, they had cut themselves off from society. And these days they are very rare, but you find them. There are still certain chapels and certain monasteries in the mountains, in the faraway places, and this is still around. Even here in America we have uh, places that uh, nobody goes in or out except if you're a part of that order, a part of that, uh, uh, if you like, uh, servitude. You, you have dedicated yourself to the church and there are special monasteries for men, special monasteries for women and in it all they do is they worship, they pray, uh, they sing to their Lord, uh, they have cut off themselves from marriage, from any type of recreation and they're 24-7 just worshipping Allah. And it was more common in the past and it is still uh, it is still a phenomenon that is existent in our times. So they pass by a monastery and the monastery is has nothing to do with the travelers. And they have gone by this monastery many times. This time, the leader of the monastery, the, the monk in charge of the monastery, he followed them out and he called them. And he said to them, to, uh, there's a number of versions of the, of the story, in one version he invites them to the monastery. And in another version he simply discusses with them uh, directly. And in the end he tells Abu Talib that this young boy that you have with you is going to be the prophet of the Arabs. Uh, I saw every single tree uh, prostrate, a spiritual prostration that he didn't, nobody else saw but he saw. And I saw the cloud shelter him. And in another version he sat under a tree and the monk said that the sign of the prophet would be that he would sit under uh, this tree. And he asked him who is your father? And so Abu Talib said I am his father. And the monk said no, this is not possible. So Abu Talib said I am actually his uncle. And so the monk said yes, the prophet cannot have his father living, that is of the signs. And this is a long story and at the very end of it the monk allegedly says that uh, be careful because the Romans, in another version, the Jews are going to kill this lad if they get a hold of him and therefore be careful and protect him and he is going to be the leader of the Arabs. Now, this is the story that all of us have heard. It's time for a little bit of, of critical uh, thinking and a little bit of isnad analysis. The story is problematic on many levels. First and foremost, the story mentions in one version that Abu Bakr was accompanying the Prophet and in another version it says that Bilal was the slave of the caravan. And this is simply historically impossible. Because Abu Bakr and the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr would have been too young. And there is no recorded friendship when the Prophet ﷺ was 10 years old. Additionally, Bilal has not yet been born, much less become a slave in Mecca when the Prophet ﷺ is 10 years old. Another problem with this story is that the contents raise our eyebrows. Not that the Prophet has been predicted in the previous scriptures, we know this, that he has been predicted. But the manner of the story and the fact that had Buhaira actually said this to the Prophet in front of Abu Talib, the Quraysh would have known and Abu Talib would have known. And many years later the Prophet would have said, Oh my uncle, why are you doubting I'm a Prophet? Don't you remember when I was a teenager? Such and such happened. Don't you remember that Buhaira said this when I was 10 years old? How can you doubt it now? And the Quraysh would have known of this uh, story as well. And all of this sends our alarm bells ringing. And this shows us that, subhanAllah, we, don't, we need to be a little bit more careful in what we read in books and folklores and legends. Not everything is authentic. And when we look at the chain of this narration, we find that indeed there is some problem even with the chain. There is some problem with the content. 
And that is why many of the early scholars, I'm not the first one critiquing it, Imam al-Zahabi, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Sayyid al-Nas, a lot of the, the classical and medieval scholars, uh, they, they found this story problematic. For example, Imam al-Zahabi said, Abu Bakr was only 10 at the time. And as for Bilal, he was purchased by Abu Bakr after the da'wah began, 30 years down the line, and he had not yet been born. And al Dhahabi is speaking, why would the trees shelter him when, according to the same report, the clouds were walking on top of him? It makes no sense for the trees to offer a shelter when there's already clouds that are uh, going over him. And why don't we find that the Prophet reminded Abu Talib of this incident and the statement of the monk? And why didn't he mention this to the Quraysh when he began preaching his prophethood? And if this really had occurred, they would not have found his prophethood something strange and they would have welcomed it. And if, had re if it had really occurred, then when Jibreel visited him in Ghari Hira, he would not have wondered who is this angel and he would have welcomed it instead of run running back to his wife in Khadija out of fear. End quote. Now this is the mind of a critical thinker. He's thinking that it doesn't make any sense. That if the Prophet ﷺ knew that he's going to be a prophet, then he must be waiting for it and expecting it. Now, somebody can ask, what's the big deal? Why do you have to be so critical? It's a beautiful story and our Prophet ﷺ is praised even more. The angels are sheltering him, the clouds are coming, the, pr the trees are prostrating. Why do you have to be so, so academic? Can't you just tell these fables and, 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 and let it be, you know, easy about this? To which the response comes. Indeed, the stories of the seerah, by and large, have not been narrated with those same rigorous chains as the ahadith pertaining to halal and haram. And even Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said, when it comes to halal and haram, we'll be very strict. And he went like this. And when it comes to hadith, uh, sorry, when it comes to, sorry, when it comes to seerah, he said maghazi, when it comes to seerah, he went like this. No big deal. Let it be. And this is true. Because many of the details of the seerah are mentioned in reports that are not 100% verifiable. And so we know the details of the Battle of Badr and the number of camels in the Battle of Uhud and a specific fight in the Battle of the Khandaq. Many of these stories are not narrated with those rigorous chains. And by and large, even in my narration of the seerah to you, I let these stories go by. No big deal. However, sometimes we have to stop it. Why and when? When the story raises problems. And this is one of those stories. Why does it raise problems? Because the primary problem really of this story is that many people who don't believe in our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu they have to answer a very difficult question. Where did the Prophet Sallallahu get the idea of being a Prophet and the knowledge that he came with as a Prophet? And this is something that is a mu'jiza, a miracle. And I mentioned this many times previously, that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not know the stories of Isa and Musa. He never heard the name of Yunus. This not, it's not of the ancestry of the Arabs. What has he got to do with this, with that branch of humanity? Neither is the concept of prophecy known to the Arabs. After the time of Ismail, two, three thousand years ago, the Arabs have never seen or heard of a prophet. And they never knew what is a prophet. So for the Prophet Muhammad to come and say, I am a prophet, he is bringing something novel for the Arabs of his time. And the Quran mentions this many verses. You didn't know what was Iman. You didn't know what was Wahi. You didn't know what were the, 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 the stories of the prophets of old. And for the longest time, people would say, the Prophet learned this, the non-Muslims would say, he learned these stories in his journey to Syria. And this is an example here. Buhaira fired up his imagination. One of the famous Orientalists of the last century, he goes, this monk fired up his imagination. He must have told him stories of Jesus Christ and Moses. And so the young lad came back and 30 years later, those stories are found in garbled form because they're not in the pure form of the Old and New Testament. The Islamic version is always different. And so apparently from this guy's perspective, he learned these stories and then he regurgitated them as an older man. And the response to this is that 
really without even you bringing in this, this tangent, the story doesn't make sense. Many of our classical scholars rejected it and in my heart I, I, I don't find this to be a comforting story. Imam al-Dhahabi said, I think the story is fabricated. And so the story of the monk, the story of the process of meeting the monk, it has some problems and it is not uh, mentioned in every book of Sirah and its isnad has issues and its content has issues and therefore it is best to simply narrate it and point out that many of our classical scholars uh, did not uh, find the story acceptable. The next phase in the Prophet's life was that when he was a young man, probably around 15, 16 years old. And as we said many times, the early life of the Prophet ﷺ is the most undocumented. We have nothing from the time he was 9, 10 till the time he's 15, except for one story here, one story there. And we explain this many times. Nobody is witnessing what's happening and recording it. Nobody knows that this person is going to be a Prophet of Allah. Nobody uh, is writing down anything. There is no writing in Mecca, right? There is no records. Additionally, those who lived long were few. The people who accompany the process and when he's a young boy, who are they? Where are they now? By the time he's 50, 60, most of them have passed away. By the time he passes away, وسلم, where are the people who would have remembered, oh, this is what happened when he was a child. Even look at your own fathers. You have memories, of course, you know. Your own fathers and your grandfathers, how much do you know when they were 8 years old, 9 years old, 10 years old, what happened to them? All you know is... One story here, another story there. Isn't that the case? And this is your own father. How about someone uh, 14 centuries ago, the Prophet ﷺ, when there is no uh, records, there are no photographs, there are no uh, nothing. So imagine now, and so we have a lot of blanks in this regard. So the next bit of information we have was the first job of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Bukhari, so it is completely authentic. Allah never sent a prophet except that he was a shepherd. He was a shepherd of sheep. So they said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. And this shows, notice this, the majority of the Sahaba didn't know that the Prophet ﷺ had a job as a shepherd. And they are his companions. And so how about the other details when he was a child? So they said, how about you? They thought he would be an exception because they never thought he was a shepherd. How about you, Ya Rasulullah? So they're trying to find an exception because he's just said all the prophets are shepherds. So they said, but how about you? So they're trying to so, but you weren't a shepherd. So he said, yes, I was. I was a shepherd and I used to tend to the flock of the people of Mecca in return for some qararit, some pennies, the smallest denomination, some cheap coins, some pennies. Because what is a shepherd going to get you? In return for some pennies, this is what I would do. And in another hadith, the Prophet wasallam, in one of the later expeditions, he saw some of the shepherds taking care of the sheep that they had. And so he said, uh, I advise you to find the tree of the Iraq, a specific type of tree, uh, and find the darker branches because it will be better for your flock. So they were shocked and they said, how do you know this, O Messenger of Allah? How do you know which plant is the best for the sheep? And not even which plant, but which season of the plant is best for the sheep? So he said, I used to be a uh, shepherd. I used to be a shepherd and every prophet that Allah has sent used to be a shepherd. And in another version of the hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad, he said, Musa was sent when he was a shepherd, meaning sent by Allah to the people, when he was a shepherd. And Dawood was sent to become a prophet when he was a shepherd. And I too was a shepherd in Ajad. Where is Ajad? Now there is a big hospital called Ajad Hospital. And it is right behind the Haram. Right? And that is Ajad. That is the place of Ajad. I was a shepherd in Ajad. That hospital behind the Haram, the closest hospital to the Haram itself, is called Ajad. And it was in a valley. And so he said, that is the valley that I would uh, go take my sheep in. And I was a shepherd in this valley of Ajad. And this is so true. Musa alayhi salam was a shepherd. He, he was a shepherd for the, 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 the man in Midian. Remember when he went out and the man said, I need you to take care of my flock and if you do, then I'll marry my daughter to you. He was a shepherd. And as he was a shepherd, then he became a prophet. Similarly, Dawood, the story of David and Goliath, right? Dawood was not uh, a famous person. The, Dawood was some shepherd. Dawood was no, nobody. And they were all wondering, how are we going to kill Goliath, Jalut? And so Dawood came to the prophet uh, to the king, uh, uh, Saul, 
Talut, and he said, I will kill this mighty giant. And everybody laughed. What are you as a shepherd? And he invented, uh, and he invented the, what did he invent? The slingshot, right? And he figured out how to throw a stone at, with great force at the mighty king or the mighty uh, uh, emperor Goliath, Jalut. And this is how he became the king and the prophet. He was a shepherd. And similarly, our prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he was a shepherd uh, tending to the sheep of uh, the people of Mecca. What are some of the wisdoms? Why would Allah Azza wa do this? If Allah had willed, our Prophet would have been born in the lap of luxury. If Allah had willed, he would not have to lift a finger. If Allah had willed, money would be poured upon him as a child and as a teenager and as an adult. Why would Allah will that our Prophet starts his life with the most menial, the lowest paid, the most difficult job in Really, in all of Mecca, why would Allah Azza wa Jalla will this? Because there's a lot of wisdoms here. First and foremost, being a shepherd gives you the opportunity to engage in solitude, to think. When you're a shepherd, you're all alone. You go away from society, from people, you take your flock of sheep, there are no other human beings, and you have solitude, you contemplate, and you think about the purpose of life. And subhanAllah, is, this is a, something, we just look around us. Those people who are busy with the dunya are the least spiritual. Those people who are engrossed with the world, with our jobs. Those people who have nothing to do other than this world, they can get by ignoring religion. And it's not a coincidence, by the way, that atheism is more popular and more common in the most opulent and rich countries. And also amongst the professions that have the most money. Generally speaking, farmers, you know, people who are in, involved with nature, they're very religious people. Isn't that the case? Right? Why? Because when you're involved with nature, with the creation of Allah, automatically it has an impact on your soul. You cannot really be an atheist if you're tending the flock and you're seeing nature and you're taking care of your cultivation and you're seeing the, when you're involved with this, you have this iman, this ruhaniya, this spirituality. And when you're cut off from the creation of Allah and you're immersed in this dunya, your heart becomes hard. And you can ignore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can even be so arrogant as to say there is no God. And again, it's not a coincidence. The people who are the poorest on earth are generally the most religious. And the people who are the most immersed in materialism, they have the hardest hearts and they can uh, ignore uh, the fact of religion and being religious. Another benefit of being a shepherd Sheep are very similar to men, in that they need to be taken care of or else they're going to go astray. They need to be taken care of or else they will go astray. Sheep need a shepherd. And every single animal has a personality. And the shepherd understands this personality. And I have never been a shepherd, but I have spoken to shepherds. I have spoken to those who took care of a uh, flock in Arabia. And they told me the exact same thing. That you need to treat every animal according to that animal's personality. Some sheep are stubborn, some are soft and gentle, right? Some, uh, they know where they're going, others they follow the pack. Some are the leaders, some are not. So the shepherd gets to understand each and every sheep in the flock. Now someone like me, they all look the same. I can't tell them apart. But the shepherd knows everyone. If you go to the, any farmer, he will mention, yeah, he'll mention names. This is this, this is that, this is this. To me, they all look the same, right? But to the shepherd, he knows everyone and everyone's personality. And he deals with every animal according to its personality. And this is what a leader needs to do. And this is what a prophet of Allah needs to do. That they need to deal with every person according to their mizaj, according to their personality. Also, another blessing of being a shepherd is that being a shepherd makes you soft and tender on the one hand and brave and courageous on the other. Soft and tender for your own flock and brave and courageous in fighting wolves and in fighting other beasts that will attack the sheep. And you are all alone in the desert. You're all alone. You have, you don't, there's not a group of people there with you. And so it simultaneously makes you soft and loving because these are your animals, you have to take care of them and it also makes you brave and fearless because you are responsible to protect your flock against the enemy. And our Prophet wasallam said that uh, the people uh, who own horses are going to be the ones who are full of pride and the people who own camels 
are going to be the ones full of arrogance. And the people who own sheep will be the ones full of sakina and wiqar, humility and humbleness. Right? Horse owners, they're always proud. Nothing wrong with that if you don't take it at un -Islamic. The Prophet is making a factual statement that horse owners, they have this sense. Camel owners, they become coarse and they become arrogant a little bit. And sheep, those who take care of sheep, they have waqar and sakina, humility and humbleness. And this is exactly one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made every prophet a person who took care of sheep. And so a shepherd inculcates certain qualities, patience, humbleness, humility, bravery, mercy, tenderness. And it is not a coincidence that later on in life, our Prophet was very tender towards animals because he was a shepherd. And there is a whole aspect of animal rights in Islam, which inshallah maybe one day we'll give a talk about animal rights in Islam. I've given a whole talk previously in other places about animal rights in Islam. Our Prophet once, a camel came to him, a camel came to him and began making its noises and tears came out of its eyes. And the hadith is in uh, Sunan al-Nisa'i. And the Prophet soothed the camel and calmed it down until it stopped crying. And then he said, where is the owner of the camel? And a man came and he goes, this animal has complained against you. SubhanAllah. This animal has complained against you. That you overwork it and underfeed it and you beat it. Fear Allah with regards to these animals that Allah has blessed you with. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. You're not allowed to be cruel even to animals. And he's telling the owner, fear Allah with regards to this animal that Allah has blessed you with. There's a tenderness even towards animals. Where did this come from? Of course, from Allah. But all of this builds that up. Being a shepherd and taking care of the flock. Another aspect of being a shepherd at this young age, he's hardly 14, 15 years old. It shows that he understands he needs to earn money. He's not going to be a freeloader off of his uncle Abu Talib. He needs to get on his own feet and be independent. And to help his uncle out to take care of the expenses of the house. Yet another blessing of being a shepherd is to show the simple lifestyle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he used to do the most, the most, if you like, baseline of manual labor. There's nothing really that is more, uh, you know, difficult and more, uh, and lesser paid than this. This is the baseline of manual labor. And our Prophet Sallallahu did it and he got paid for it. And this really shows us that there is no sin, there is no dishonor in working for your own money and in working for your own rizq. Our Prophet Sallallahu did it and the Prophet Sallallahu said that the purest money that you can earn is the money that you earn from the labor of your hands. This is the purest money. You do some physical work from the sweat of your back. You do some physical work and then you get paid for it. And then he said, and even the Prophet Dawood alayhi salam, he would earn his money from the labors of his hands. What was the Prophet Dawood? Who can tell me? What was he? He was an iron smith and he was also a carpenter. He was a carpenter and an ironsmith and he would get money from these things and that is how he would take care of himself. And this shows us as well that one of the greatest signs of sincerity is that you do something for the good of the people in return for nothing from them. The Prophet ﷺ earned his own sustenance. He didn't get it from the people around him. And there are many verses in the Quran, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أجرا. قُلْ مَا أَسَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مَالًا I'm not asking you for money. I'm not asking you for sustenance when I'm preaching to you what Islam is. I have no motive for doing this other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the reality that when you don't have a favor, sorry, when the people don't have a favor on you, then you are more pure in your call to them. When they're not paying you, what excuse and motivation do you have for being a prophet of Allah? And also one final point here. It shows us that even when the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet and he had all that he wanted, if he wanted to have it, he could have had it. He was not embarrassed to tell people of his simple past. I started over there. And this is the reality of everything, not just religion, but the deen and dunya. You need to start at the bottom and work your way to the top.
and then you will be the most successful. If you start at the top, somehow it happens, a fluke of coincidence, a birthright, something. You're not ever going to be as successful as those who started from the bottom and worked their way to the top. And this is the reality of business as it is the reality of the religion as well. Look at the most successful entrepreneurs on the face of this earth. People like Bill Gates and, and, and Steve Jobs and all of them, they all started from the bottom, from their basements and from their backyards and from their garages. Isn't that the case? And they are the ones who then build the largest empires. Never is the one who inherits all of this instantaneously as successful as the one who builds it from scratch. It's the sunnah of Allah. And the same applies with the Prophet Muhammad He started right from the bottom to get to the highest pinnacle. He went through every phase of life and then when you get there, then indeed Allah has blessed you with it and Allah has caused you to deserve it and earn it. Otherwise, if you just get it without any labor, then you will not appreciate it and you will not do justice to it. So our Prophet begins being a shepherd and he works his way all the way to the top of being the Prophet of Allah. And look how true is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord has not abandoned you, nor has He shown you any harshness. وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى And every stage that happens to you will be better than every stage that came. Your life will become easier, and even the next life will be better than this life. وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى Allah will give you until you are content. You will be content. Everything. أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَى Didn't I find you an orphan and I was the one who protected you? وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًّا فَهَدَى And we found you not upon guidance and we gave you guidance. وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى And we found you with nothing and we gave you all that you needed. We found you with no money and we gave you all the money that you needed. Therefore, فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Be good to the beggar, be good to the orphan. When Allah has blessed you with so much, have a soft heart. And that's what we said. When you begin in a such a harsh manner, you will have a soft heart and you will appreciate the blessings of Allah. And if all of this were to have been handed to him instantaneously, then he would not have had that appreciation that he had. After this incident of taking care of sheep and being a shepherd, only two or three things are narrated before the prophethood begins. The first of these are the Fijar Wars. The Fijar Wars of the Quraysh. When the Prophet was a teenager, probably around 18, 17, maybe even 15, we don't know for sure exactly because again nobody is recording dates. Between 15 to 18. When the Prophet was a teenager, and most likely by the way, closer to 15, because he didn't physically fight, he didn't participate. And this shows that he was not of that age that he would carry a sword. And they would usually allow a person to carry a sword at around 15. That's when he became what we call 18. In, those, in our days, that's the being a man. In those days, they didn't have the luxury to wait till you're 18. 15, 14 is when you become a full uh, adult. So, uh, the, the Fijar Wars is a series of small battles that broke out between two large tribes of Arabia. And again, not to get too much into the Arab uh, uh, you know, tribes of old, but we need to have a little bit of understanding. Uh, the tribe of Quraysh belongs to a much larger tribe. It's called a branch, not a tribe, of Kinana. Kinana is not the name of one tribe. Kinana is the name of many large tribes. Of them is Quraysh. And on the another large branch of uh, of the Arab race was a tribe, or not a, a tribe, but a branch called Qais Ailan. Qais Ailan. Qais Ailan. Uh, it is composed of tribes such as Ghatafan, such as Hawazin. These are tribes that are going to come up in the Sira, right? Ghatafan, Hawazin. They belong to the larger branch of Qais Ailan. Quraysh and others. They belong to the larger branch of Kinana. To make a long story short, a person from the Kinana, which is one of the uh, the larger tribes of Quraysh. So Quraysh belongs to Kinana. A person from Kinana killed somebody from the Hawazin. And when they found out the Hawazin attacked the Kinanite tribes, and Quraysh is one of them. This is what Jahiliya is. You kill one of mine, I'm going to go kill one of yours. So the tribes of Kinana, including the Quraysh, they rushed back into the Haram. What is the Haram? The holy sanctuary of Mecca, right? And the outlying lands. Why did they do this? Because the rule of law, which is still a rule of law in our religion, when you enter the Haram, what happens? 
وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ Amina. Whoever enters the haram, you are safe. So they rushed back into the haram. Hawazin followed them. And because they were so angry, so incensed, they didn't care about the haram and they attacked uh, the kinana. Now, this is interesting here. The initial fault was that of the side of the Quraysh. But the rebuttal was much more severe because killing one person outside the haram is a crime. Attacking the sanctity of the haram is a much bigger crime. Much bigger crime. And therefore, the Quraysh declared all out war against Hawazin and against the uh, Qais Ajlan. You guys are understanding this point here, right? Both sides are at fault. The initial fault was done by the Qurayshi side. Not somebody from Quraysh, but from Kinana, the larger sub tribe. The initial fault. Then the other tribe attacks Mecca. And they break the haram sanctity. Now the Quraysh are incensed. You have broken the sanctity of the haram. We're going to attack you. And so all out war broke out. This is called the wars of Fijar. And initially uh, the opposing side was winning. And the Quraysh was losing. Eventually the Quraysh won over. And then a peace treaty was enacted. There was Fighting was limited. Finally a peace treaty was enacted. And the Quraysh agreed to pay the blood money. And so the fighting stopped. The Prophet ﷺ says in an authentic hadith when he's much older, he says, I remember participating in the Fijar Wars. Why, why is it called Fijar Wars? Fijar means evil, Fujur, Fajr, evil. Evil wars. Why? Because both sides committed evil, but especially because the sanctity of the Haram was broken, which is the height of evil. These are evil wars, Fijar Wars, because the sanctity of the Haram was broken. So. The Prophet ﷺ said, I remember fighting in the wars of Fijar and I would collect arrows for my uncles and hand them back to my uncles. Now what does this mean? So arrows are weapons you can use back and forth. When somebody shoots an arrow and it misses the target, in fact even if it hits the target, you can take it out or you can pick it up and then you can use it back against the enemies. It's an ammunition that you can use over and over again, correct? So, the Prophet's job was to go find those arrows and to go look for those arrows in the mountains. When he found them, he would go and return them to his uncles and they would then use them against the other tribe. And the Prophet said, I do not regret participating in that war. I participated and I do not regret it. I don't, it's nothing wrong that I did, that I helped the Quraysh against, the, uh, against the, their enemies of the Qais uh, Ailan. Also, it is narrated that Whenever the Prophet ﷺ would appear with the Quraysh, on that day, the Quraysh would win over. Whenever he would not be at home, the Quraysh would lose ground. And so when Abu Talib uh, saw this, he said, By Allah, you're not going to leave my sight anymore. You're going to stay with us. And eventually they reached a peace treaty and the fighting uh, stopped after that. In another few years, even a more famous incident occurred. And this is called the Hilf al-Fudul or the Hilf al-Mutayyabin, the Treaty or the Pact of Fudul, also called the Treaty of Mutayyabin. And what is this about? And at this stage, the Prophet ﷺ is probably in his early 20s, probably in his early 20s, so a number of years after the Fijar Wars. This pact or this treaty occurred in Dhul Qa'dah, uh, one of the sacred months uh, in Mecca. According to one report, the Prophet ﷺ was exactly 20 years old. What happened was, a person from the tribe of Zubayd, and Zubayd is a tribe in Yemen. And so the Yemenites, when you're in Mecca, the people did not consider this tribe to be as elite. They are a low class tribe. So the people of this tribe are not the status of Hawazin or Thaqif, they, and, and they're very far away. So when you're far away, what this means is, you don't have people willing to fight for you, right? Now, let's say right now, we just talked about a war between uh, Hawazin and Kinana. These two are tribes neighboring one another. If you kill somebody from one tribe, the next tribe is across the border. They're going to come and attack, which is exactly what happened. This guy from Zubaid, if they were to do something to him, where are his allies, where are his brothers, where are his tribes? All the way in Yemen. Who's going to come to defend you? And this is the reality of Jahili society. So what happens? This person from the tribe of Zubaid, sold an item before Hajj. He's come as a merchant. He's brought his leather, he's brought his good. That's how you get your money. And he sold a number of items to Al-As ibn Wa'il, 
the father of Amr ibn al-As, the famous Amr ibn al-As, this is his father, al-As ibn al-Wa'il. And al-As ibn al-Wa'il, he is a chieftain, he's a politician, he's a career statesman in the Quraysh, and he's a rich businessman. He sold it to him before Hajj. And al-As said, I'll give you the money after Hajj before you go back to Yemen. Come to me after and I'll give it to you. So he goes, okay, fine. I can wait that long, I don't need it now, I need it back in Yemen. So he performs the Hajj, and then he says, I need my money. Al-As says, come back tomorrow. So he comes back tomorrow. Al-As says, come back tomorrow again. Comes back tomorrow. And then he continues doing this until he realizes that he's not going to get his money back. And he's simply stalling him. And he's not giving him his money. And so this person goes to the other sub-tribes. He goes to the Banu Hashim. He goes to the Banu Abd al He goes to the Banu Abd al Manaf. All of them in Quraysh. And he goes, I need some help. This guy's not giving me my money back. And everyone makes an excuse. Why? Because Al As ibn Wa'il is a politician. He is rich. He is a leader. And you don't want to get on the bad side of a leader. Everyone makes an excuse. Oh, I really can't do anything, this and that. And therefore, feeling completely trapped and not having any other uh, outlet, he decided to make this a public issue. What did they do in those days? They would write poems. And they would announce these poems. Poems in those days is like news media. It's like the internet. It's like a blog post, right? It's like Twitter. You're going to just send it immediately. And you're not limited to 160 characters when you write a poem. And so, he wrote a poem. He didn't even, I mean, in those days, you didn't have to write it. It just comes to you naturally. SubhanAllah, it's amazing. I don't know how they did it. It just comes to you naturally, and then you say it out loud, and then this spreads everywhere. That this person has made this poem. And so, one day, when everybody is in front of the Kaaba, which is basically everybody would gather around Asr time, all the people of Mecca would now come, and they would say this is a social place as well. He now comes and he says out loud, his poem that he has uh, compiled. Ya ala fihr li mazlumin bida'atahu bi batni Mecca na idari wa nafari. Oh, family of fihr. Fihr is who? Who can tell me? Who's fihr? Who is fihr? We mentioned this so many weeks ago. Fihr is Quraysh. Fihr is the name of Quraysh. Fihr is the name of Quraysh. Quraysh is his title. So he says, Ya ala fihrin. O tribe of Fihr, O Quraysh, I am a one who has been unjustly treated because of my merchandise. I am in the valley of Mecca, far away from my home and far away from people to protect me. I'm still in my ihram. My hair has not been combed because he's an ihram. Lam yaqdi umratahu. I haven't even finished my umrah. Ya lil rijali. Where are my men to help me? Wa bain al hijri wal hajari. Between the hijr, the maqam Ibrahim, and the hajar, the stone, you are doing this to me. I am in ihram and I'm in this state and I am between the hijr and the hajar. The, the, the hijr is that round semicircle, and the hajar is the hajar aswad, and this is being done to me. Inna al haram li man tammat karamatuhu. The true haram belongs to those who are noble. Wala haram li thawb al ghadir al fajri. There is no sanctity to the one who wears a thawb. Most likely, there was a thawb in there involved as well. Who wears a thawb? while he is a cheat and a steal and a lowly person. You don't have any karama, you don't have any sanctity, simply because you live in Mecca, simply because you're in a holy land. You are a bunch of cheaters and losers. That's what you are. That's basically what he's saying. And I am in this state of ihram, and you are doing this to me, just because I'm far away from my house and my land and my people. So the news spread like wildfire. And as Zubayr ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's uncle, elder uncle, Az zubayr ibn Abdul Muttalib, heard of this. And he said, we have to do something about this. This is not going to go on anymore. And he convened a gathering of all of the senior members of the Quraysh in the house of somebody whose name you should memorize. He comes up in Sirah over and over again. Abdullah ibn Jud'an. Abdullah ibn Jud'an. Abdullah ibn Jud'an was a distant uncle of Aisha. She was a distant uncle of Aisha, and he was considered to be the most noble of the people of Mecca of his time. He didn't live until the da'wah. He died before the da'wah began. 
But he was considered to be the most legendary in terms of hospitality, in terms of genuine sincerity, and he was known to be the problem solver. And he was the most elderly. So they, they convened in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an, and here is where they agreed to a pact, a treaty. What was the pact and treaty? Treaty that they would side with the oppressor against the oppressed, regardless of what ethnicity or what tribe was the oppressor. They would side, sorry, did I say the wrong? I said the other way around. They would side with the oppressed against the oppressor, obviously. They would side with the oppressed against the oppressor, regardless of which tribe the oppressor belonged to. And they said, even if the one who is shown injustice is from a faraway tribe and the oppressor is from a Quraysh sub-tribe, we will side with the one who has been oppressed and we will get his full rights from the oppressor. And they all went in front of the Kaaba and they publicly announced this and they signed their names on a document. Now, there is no document, there is no signature. What do you do in those days? You dip your hands in perfume. They're all illiterate. They don't ha know how to read and write. There is no pen and paper. How do you sign your name? You go in public, you announce everybody that this is our treaty, and then you dip your hand in perfume, and you put that perfume on the Kaaba on the same place. Everybody puts it on the same place. And that is why this is called Hilf al mutayyabin Tayyib means perfume. And so this is the treaty of those who have perfumed themselves. Hilf al mutayyabin It is also called Hilf al fudul Many people uh, try to explain why. The most strongest reason seems to be that when Al-Asi bin Wa'il heard of this, he became irritated and angry. And he said, why did they have to get involved in a manner, in a matter that is fuduli, none of their business? Because fuduli means none of their business, right? Fuduli to them. It's none of their business. Why are they getting involved? So this is another interpretation of why it's called hilf al-fudul. And then there are other reasons why people say it's fudul. But this seems to be the strongest. Why it's called hilf al-fudul. So because he said this is amrun fuduli. None of your business what I did. And so they called it the treaty of no business because it is our business. Hilf al-fudul. That's one, another name. So it's called Hilf al-Fudul and Hilf al mutayyabin And the Arabs had never heard of such a pact before. This is the first time, this is basically what we call government. Where people come together and they say, no, enough is enough. We're not going to allow injustice. And the Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said, I witnessed in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an a treaty that were I asked to uphold it even in Islam, I would do so. If I were to ask to follow the treaty even now, I would do so. And I would not be willing to give up my place for a lot of red camels. Meaning, if you were to tell me, if you were to give me a lot of money and I were not present at that treaty, I would not do so. I would not be willing to do so. In that treaty, he's saying, they all agreed that the rights would be given back to the ones who deserve them and that no oppressor would have the upper hand over the one who was oppressed. Now, from these two incidents, Hilf al, uh, the, the Hilf al-Fudul and the Fijar Wars, what benefits can we derive? And then inshallah with that we will open the floor. From these two incidents, the Hilf al-Fudul and the Fijar Wars, what benefits can we derive? Many benefits, first and foremost. The Prophet ﷺ did not regret participating in the wars of Fijar. And the fact that he later says this and boasts about this, somebody can say, but hold on, he wasn't a prophet at the time. This is something he did before prophethood. How can you derive lessons from it? We say, he narrated this later on and he said, I do not regret this. Showing that what he did was correct. And this shows us that it is permissible, and some scholars have derived this, some ulama have derived this, that it is permissible to even fight in wars and battles that are not necessarily religious, because this is a war that has nothing to do with religion. It's a war to defend the haram and the sanctity of the haram. Both sides are pagan. Both sides are idol worshippers. Both sides believe in the same gods. And yet the Prophet ﷺ participated. Now others point out that he didn't quite physically fight. He aided. He helped. What did he do? He gave the arrows to uh, his people. So there's a lot of fiqh that you know, people are debating to what level. But the bottom line is that 
even in such wars where things are being defended which are not purely religious, the Muslim has some leeway to do something to get involved because the Prophet ﷺ did do something. And in this war, it's not a clear cut line of good versus evil because both sides have done some evil. But one side has done more evil than the other. And the Prophet ﷺ was fighting on the side that was closer to the truth. And again, he wasn't quite fighting, but he was participating in some manner. And this is some point to think about in the world that we live in, when many of the battles that are being waged, uh, we're talking about battles that don't involve Muslim lands, let's say, many of the battles are very murky. Can we help out? Can we support? This is some fiqh that can be discussed from this incident. Likewise, the issue of the Hilfa Fudur and Mutayyabin, these incidents show that, and this is a very important point for us in America, that the Prophet ﷺ was actively involved with the society of his time. Even though the society of his time was not Muslim, and he was proud of that involvement, and the causes that he got involved with are not purely religious causes. So the Hilfa al-Fudul involves justice involves truth, involves helping the oppressed. And later on he is saying, I am proud to have been there, and even now as a prophet and a Muslim, were I, to, were I called to uphold that treaty, I would proudly do so. And this clearly shows us that getting involved in public causes is a part of being a good Muslim. And this is one of the biggest problems that we have as a minority here in America, is that we think we should only get involved in what we think are purely Islamic causes. We don't get involved with racism, with oppression, with poverty, with child abuse, with sexual abuse. We say, oh, these things, these are just other problems. We only get involved with Palestine and Kashmir and a flood over here and a flood over there and an earthquake over here in Muslim lands. Those are all good causes. I'm not astaghfirullah making fun of it. But at the same time, from the seerah, what do we learn? The Prophet ﷺ was an active part of his society and he is supporting justice in his society. And that justice has nothing to do with Islam or non-Islam, with Muslim or Kafir. And this is one of the biggest faults, in my humble opinion, of us as a minority. That we still don't seem to have a connection with the society around us. Think, imagine what da'wah we would have if a representative of the Red Cross Society, wanting blood, donating blood, is a bearded Muslim with a skull cap and he comes on TV, we need blood for our cause. Nothing to do with Islam, no da'wah, but that is the best da'wah. Imagine somebody talking against racism, talking against oppression, speaking out for the rights of these migrant workers, right? A, a muhajiba sister coming on the television and saying, we need to protect children's rights, we need to do this and that. No, nothing about we need to convert to Islam, we need to give that, no. But her message is her da'wah. And her involvement with society is the best da'wah that she can do, right? This is what our Prophet ﷺ said, did. Because basically, brothers and sisters, oppression is oppression, regardless of who does it and who it's done against. Racism is racism. Child abuse is child abuse. Poverty is poverty. You don't need to be a Muslim to suffer from poverty or to be helped because you're a Muslim. It affects all of us. And, listen to this, when you become involved with the problems of society, People see you as sincere. Then when you come forth and say, I'm a Muslim, your Islam is shown to be a sincere faith. And that's what our Prophet ﷺ did. He was involved with the problems of his society. And he's solving those problems. Then when he becomes a Prophet, he is known, he's loved, he's respected, his message now becomes acceptable. And nobody can come and say, who are you to preach to us? Where were you when we needed you? Where were you when society was suffering from a problem? You guys are following this point, right? And we as a Muslim community, the fact of the matter is, we are cut off from the society around us. We don't have active engagements with them. We don't have any type of cause that, SubhanAllah, I mean, I need to be concerned with my, with, uh, just as much as my neighbor for crime. Because crime affects me and it affects him. I need to be con concerned about the murder rates of Memphis. I need to be concerned about all of the issues surrounding me. And when I get involved in those issues, and I become active in them, now when I come forth and I say, well, my religion is Islam, 
people are going to listen to me because I have standing respect in society. And that's exactly what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. The, the bottom line here, there are values that are human values. Not necessarily just Islamic values, justice, security, uh, fighting against oppression. And the Muslim needs to be at the forefront in all of these issues and because the truth is linked together. When you support justice and you have the proper theology, it will come forth as a total package. Unfortunately for us, da'wah is only talk. Preaching through theology, preaching through talking to others, debating with Christians and Jews about, no, this is one minuscule aspect of da'wah. And it is not the bulk of da'wah. Our Prophet showed us what we need to do. And finally as well, this clearly demonstrates the status of the Prophet ﷺ even before becoming a Prophet, despite the fact that he is hardly 20 years old. He is called to witness the Treaty of Jud'an and to participate along with dipping his hand. He was the youngest participant. And this shows us that they saw in him a future leader. Or else they would not have invited a young man to participate in their gatherings. He was the youngest participant in the house of Jud'an and this clearly shows they sensed in him that he would become a great leader and that is exactly what happened. And this incident also shows us that despite all of the differences and despite all of the problems of the Arabs and the Quraysh, they still had good in them. And they had characteristics of nobility and of virtue and despite their tribal differences they agreed to come together to help the wrong and the oppressed and this shows us that even though it was a time of jahiliyyah they were still there was still an element of virtue in them and it was because of this virtue and because of this element of good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to send our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in their midst to revive those very virtues inshaAllah ta'ala next uh, halaqa next Wednesday we will talk about uh, the story of the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Khadija and with uh, other uh, two or three stories, the building of the Kaaba, and also how the Prophet ﷺ was protected as a young man before the prophethood. And these are the final stories that we know before the actual prophethood begins. Only two, three stories left, and that is all that we know. Forty years of the Prophet's life, really all that we have done, completely. I have not left anything. Uh, I have given you every, every story that we have from the classical tradition, and you find how little it is. And this is uh, Allah's wisdom. Uh, he has preserved what we need to know. And there has much that has happened that uh, will not have been a benefit to us. And for wisdom known to Allah, it has been uh, basically not been preserved. And inshaAllah ta'ala with this we open up the floor for around 7 or 8 minutes of questions. And then we will pray Salat Al-Isha inshaAllah. Yes, Bismillah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, Jid'an died before the Da'wah. And I just thought about that. You, know, you mentioned how he was a noble guy. Um, you know, what does Allah do with such people who did not become Muslim, obviously, but they did not get the, the Da'wah? So the question is, what is the fate of those who have not heard of Islam? Uh, this is a question that springs to the minds of many, many, many people. And the response is multifold. First and foremost, and I don't direct this only to you, it's actually to everybody here. It is not of much benefit to us to think about what is going to happen to other people. And to concentrate too much on this is actually problematic for us. We leave their affairs to Allah. That's the general rule. And the general rule as well is ask questions that are of benefit to us. And this is, we derive it from the Prophet ﷺ's hadith, that my ummah shall remain in good until they start asking about the children of the idol worshippers. It's an interesting, vague hadith. My ummah will remain in good until they begin asking about the children of the idol worshippers. Some of the scholars have interpreted this hadith. My ummah shall remain in good until they start debating about issues that are of no concern to them. I mean, what difference does it make to us what is going to happen? Allah is the most knowledgeable. Allah is the most merciful. Allah is the most wise. Allah is the most just. Let's leave it at that. That's one response and that's level one. And again, this is not just directed to you, Akhi, don't feel. Because this is, everybody has this question on their minds, right? And so, the scholars say, and this is, again, I'm not the one saying that. Again, this we found, find in our books of theology. 
that this is a fundamental problem with many people, they worry about others too much. And Islam tells us to worry about ourselves. Alaykum and fusakum. Worry about yourself. And, that's, uh, uh, and when you do that, then you actually go very far. When you think about other people a lot, what happens is you get lazy and then you think yourself, mashallah, all high and mighty. Right? That's the first point. The second point, after having said, don't ask, I will then answer anyway. Uh, because there is a theological benefit here. Scholars have differed greatly over this issue. And the bottom line is that people who had access to the teachings of Islam or knew monotheism but did not but did not avail themselves to that knowledge they will not have an excuse in the eyes of Allah and this particular person Abdullah ibn Jud'an there is a hadith in Bukhari that Aisha asked Aisha is the distant niece, uh, the grand, or the great, what is it called, great niece or grand niece, whatever, of Abdullah ibn Jud'an. And Aisha says, O Messenger of Allah, Ibn Jud'an was a great man who was kind to the neighbors and good to the people. What will be his fate? What will happen to him? So the Prophet said, he is going to the fire. So Aisha says, why? So he says, and listen to this, he never said once, Rabbi ghfirli, Rabbi ghfirli. Now, this is a very interesting point here. And I said this uh, two, three days ago in the halaqa that I was having at night. In our times, people consider piety and righteousness to be only being good to others. If you're good to other people, khalas, that's all we need from you. You will go to heaven. If you open up an orphanage in Calcutta, khalas, you will become world famous. Doesn't care what you believe, doesn't care if you think God has a son, this is, becomes irrelevant. right? If you open up uh, a hospital, if you're smiling to everybody, oh, he was a good and loving man. In this hadith we learn, no, that's all fine and dandy, yes, but there's an element that you need to do as well, and that is even more important than being good to others, and that is believing in the one who created you, and worshipping the one who created you. In the end of the day, being good to people is good. But worshipping Allah is better and more important. Of what use is it to be good to mankind when you deny the one who gave you the greatest good and that is Allah. And so this person, Ibn Juz'an, never once did he say, Rabbi ghfirli, Rabbi ghfirli. He lived a, a, a life carefree of religion. He didn't have any religiosity. And so... It's a very simple question. Why should Allah forgive somebody who never asked for forgiveness? Why should Allah reward somebody who never did anything for his sake? Very logical question, right? Why should Allah reward somebody? In our times, the verdict of piety is based completely on how good you are to others. In Islam, the verdict of piety is based on two things. What you believe and how good you are. Inna ladina amanu wa amilu salihat. Both go together. You need to have the proper belief and do it for Allah, and then you need to have good amal that follows along with that. If you have one without the other, it is of no use. It is of no use. And we say this very clearly as well. Just because somebody says they're a Muslim uh, doesn't mean anything, does not mean anything. And we believe as Muslims that no human being has the right to say, you're going to Jannah and you're going to hell. No. You don't say this of anybody unless Allah has said it. So we say Abu Bakr is going to Jannah, Iblis is going to hell. I can say this because Allah told me. We say Umar is going to Jannah, Fir'aun is going to hell. We say this because Allah has told me. Otherwise, we don't say of any person, even the greatest scholars, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, we say, we hope they're going to Jannah. Insha'Allah, they're going to Jannah. But we don't say categorically. And the same applies for the worst people on earth. We don't mention names and say, so and so is going to hell. We don't say this. Why? Because who am I? Who am I? We leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we speak in generalities. Whoever believes in Allah and does righteousness will go to paradise. This is generalities. And I hope to be amongst them. And whoever rejects Allah, 
or does not act in righteousness will go to the fire of hell and I seek refuge in Allah from being amongst them. And this is something we're very clear about. Our religion is a religion where you need to have the proper belief and the proper action. And if you have one without the other, you're not going to get there. And the people in the time of uh, early, the, Pro the Prophet Prophet's early life, they knew the true religion of Ibrahim. And they knew that Ibrahim was not an idol worshipper. And yet they simply wanted to ignore and live a carefree life. And therefore, they were not, the majority of them were not forgiven because of that. Sisters, you have a question? Yes, go ahead. Hilf al Fudul, and it's also called Hilf al Mutayyabin. Hilf al Fudul and Hilf al Mutayyabin. Yes, go ahead. Uh, you talked about a very relevant topic about community involvement that we don't seem to have done enough of when we talk about Dhamma. So we are first generation Americans, and that's a historical perspective of how that happened. But I also find blame in how our scholars and how our organizations have not paid that much attention to community service as they did to establishing masjidahs and masjidahs. What do you, and, and massages? What do you say about that and do you see that role evolving off the Muslim leadership to motivate us? So the question is that uh, what is the role of the leadership in pushing the community to get involved in these community projects? There is no question that uh, the preachers, the du'at, the ulama, the lecturers, they have a big role in educating the Muslim masses about this reality of our faith. And there is no question, that you are correct in pointing out that most people do not mention uh, community activism. You know, you hardly hear a khutbah about getting involved with the community. And in fact, not just this, you hardly hear a khutbah about a social problem. This is itself a problem. You hardly hear a khutbah about something that is relevant to the community. A lot of times khutbahs deal with things that are not relevant to the people living here. And I have, I hope inshallah I don't fall into this because I have always tried my best, uh, personally speaking, to always be relevant to the community and to speak of something that the community needs to hear. Um, definitely this is uh, changing inshallah with the second and third generation and I hope that inshallah uh, as we progress in the next few decades inshallah we hope that the Muslim community will understand the importance Islamically, politically, socially to become relevant to the community around them. Uh, of course there, is, there are a lot of factors here. One of the factors is the cultural element. When our fathers came and some of you are of that immigrant generation of course there is this this detachment that this is not my place. Of course, it's natural. There's nothing wrong with that, even, right? I mean, you didn't, you weren't born and raised here, you know. So there's always this element of you have adopted this as your homeland. A lot of people, when they came, they initially thought five years, ten years. Let me just get my education. Let me work two, three years, and those two, three years became twenty, thirty years. Some of them are still talking about going back home. You know who I'm talking about here, okay? And they still have a home empty back home somehow deluding themselves to think that they're going to go back and live there. So when, when your foot is still, one foot is still back there, I mean the fact of the matter, how are you going to become involved in a society you don't think it is your own, right? And uh, I have said many times, I mean, for those of us who are born and raised here, this is our home when we can think of no other. You know, that we cannot, you know, I, we wouldn't be able to function, wallahi, you know, I wouldn't be able to function in Karachi, you know. My parents might have lived there 20, 30 years, I, I, I cannot even imagine living there. It's not my hometown. So therefore, it's something that, inshallah, I'm optimistic. Those who have been born and raised here, they automatically feel the need to be socially relevant because this is their society, right? And inshallah, with the help and encouragement of uh, you know, a new community leaders and new activists, inshallah, we hope this will change. And I'm also very happy at what we have done here at MIC. We have done a lot of stuff, you know, with the blood drives, with the Heart Song Church. This is exactly what we need to be doing, becoming socially relevant, making sure that the community knows who we are. Alhamdulillah, this is what we hope to become a type of model institution uh, for, for other massages in North, North America. You want to add a point, Danish, to this? Yeah, I want to add a point. I think the point is we also should encourage our parents, first generation Americans, to encourage their children to go into professions that are non traditional Encourage the parents to encourage the children. Okay. Our scholars and our da'at and our lecturers and our community leaders should encourage the parents of our societies and our communities to not only become physicians and lawyers and IT professional engineers, but also Sociologists. social workers, sociologists, historians, academics, academics and all of course. sort of the gamut of the uh, mm -hmm. journalists. You know, 
And I, I think that, alhamdulillah, yani post 9-11 especially, I think that a lot of people finally see the need that engineers and doctors are great when it comes to solving equations and curing diseases, but really they're not going to become, make Islam a household name. They're not going to make this a uh, community, you know, uh, a name here. And subhanAllah, all you need to do is look at the effects that somebody like the boxer Muhammad Ali had, right? A million doctors couldn't do what this one man did. And that is to make Islam, this is back in the 60s and 70s, a household name and a symbol of respect. A million doctors and engineers could not do what this one man did. And that shows us, I mean, we need to broaden our horizons. We need to be able to, we always complain about, you know, another group, they do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. You know, if you go study these other groups and what they've done, you know, it's not as if they were handed this plate and it just descended out of thin air. They worked for it. And they got people to be active in media, active in the corporations, active in business, active in this and that. And therefore, when you're a minority and you spread your people to the places where they need to be, this is how a minority survives. It's nothing, there's nothing nefarious or evil about it. Wallahi, I'm being blunt here. This is a reality. If you're a minority amongst a majority, the only way to survive and to flourish is to make sure that your minority is in positions of influence and respectability and power. We are oversaturated with engineers and doctors, lawyers and accountants. Alhamdulillah, that's, that's, we need that. But there's an oversaturation. We have a whole you know, area here that we need to fill. My thing that I'm always pushing is we need scholars and, 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 and activists from the second generation. Of course, that's my passion and forte, that we need to stop importing with all respect to our imams and scholars, but we need to stop importing. We need to stop outsourcing Islam. We need to make our own teenagers, find somebody who's bright, educated. Instead of sending him to Harvard, send him to Azhar or Medina. Pay, pay for him, finance him. And then tell him, when you come back, you're going to be our Imam. Because we need a second generation Imam. We need somebody who can give a khutbah and our youth want to go listen. Not give excuses to go run away. Right? Because it's socially relevant. All of this goes back to this issue of, you know, not just uh, uh, scholars and imams, but we need people involved in the media, representatives, spokespersons, everybody. And to each his own. I mean, alhamdulillah, I have a certain niche here that I'm doing this. I wish I could get involved in other things, but I can't. But every one of you should have a passion and a cause. Every one of you should have something that, look, I feel very strongly about, let's say, uh, domestic abuse. I feel very strongly about it. Excellent. Go find uh, a, a non-profit, an NGO that's educating, that's preaching, and get involved with that. I feel very strongly about cancer. SubhanAllah. Go do something then. Educate the people. You know, give public service campaigns. As a Muslim, all you need to do is, you know, Muhammad so-and-so is being the spokesperson for the National Cancer Society. SubhanAllah. Something as simple as that. That you are becoming socially relevant as a Muslim. This is one of the best da'wahs that you can do. Much better than a debate. Much better than me preaching to a non-Muslim audience. You're going to preach through actions, which is what our Prophet ﷺ did. Inshallah, it's time to stop for Salat al-Isha. We will resume next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.